Um, and so we want to keep it to like five minutes. Right. Um, at the five minute mark, uh, I'll make a noise of some kind. I haven't decided what. Yeah. And uh, you'll have like a minute to finish. But I'm sure you'll be fine. Um, yeah, I'm really, it looks like a really cool lineup. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, this is Joseph Adams, who is going to talk about GISP, um, compiling Lisp to go. Thank you. Hello. Uh, as I said, I'm Joseph, and I'm going to tell you about GISP a list to go compiler. And I'm not going to show you any slides, just some code examples and a, a little ask generation level. So first of all, the way Go at GISP works is it takes a given list program, generates a uh, abstract syntax tree via lexing parsing, takes that abstract syntax tree and generates a Go abstract syntax tree, and then with the uh, ask printer, prints out a hopefully valid Go program, and the printer and the asked data types for the uh, for the asked data types are uh, available in the Go standard library. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm going to show you three examples. We'll start with the most trivial one, which is just a hello world. Um, so you can see we're defining a main function here, which just prints out hello world. Note we're using font.print line. We've got full interoperability with pre-existing Go code. And the code it generates for this looks pretty reasonable. It's that. And since this example is quite triv trivial, we'll move on to the next one, which is the factorial example. It's a bit big, sorry. <coughs> so here again, we have main and factorial. That's defined recursively. And one thing to note here is we're uh, doing a type assertion, that's this bit here, on the output of the factorial call, and uh, then we're casting it to an int. I'll come to that in a second, why we're doing it. Additionally, we're importing this second package, call, which is, uh, which is uh, what I'll get to now as well. The code it generates looks like this, and you'll notice that factorial returns a core.any type, which is an empty interface which means that in this case we're not type safe. Um, I'm working towards adding optional type annotations, but that's what the type assertion and then the cast are for, uh, so that we get the proper output with the printf. And another thing to note is we have this if condition, in the if statement here, it's wrapped in a function literal call. We do this because in Lisp, everything is an expression, as you probably know. Uh, but in Go, statements don't have values, which is uh, why we wrap this in a function literal. So we get the values, the return of the function. Coming to the third and uh, most complex example, this is the solution to the 14th Project Euler uh, problems, if you're familiar with that, the longest collapse sequence. Uh, you'll notice we'll ha we have loop and recur. Uh, constructs which uh, enable tail call optimizable uh, functions or algorithms generally which are usually not possible in Go and uh, we also have bindings with a let and in the loop uh, they support multiple return values so you can also use those if you have libraries that do multiple return values like most of the standard library and um, Let's, let's jump to the generated code. So just to note, this is about 30 lines. The indentation on this generated Go code is quite extreme, not very idiomatic in general. Um, and I'd like to change that. Yeah. Another thing is you can see the operators like add and greater than, less than, greater than, equal, and so forth. <coughs> They're all uh, abstracted away as functions also in core because the empty interface doesn't define addition, subtraction, and so on and so forth. Another thing to note is if you look at the function name here, it's, as usual in Go, camel case. But if we look back at the Lisp, uh, it's, well, separated by dashes. So all the identifiers also in the bodies of the functions, they're made idiomatic. Um, so that means it doesn't look odd if you're calling GISP code from your Go program. So to wrap up the uh, talk, you've seen lots of the generated code. 
I'd like to show you a little example of the AST. <laughs> I'd like to show you a quick example of the AST generated for the Go. So let's say we have uh, some function call. We support integers, we also have floats, uh, complex numbers, vectors, which are handled as slices, and so, uh, yeah, which are handled as slices. Um, and the ask that gets generated for that looks like this, and that just gets printed out, and that's what you saw before. And that's GISP. Thanks Ooh. for listening. Um, there's no time for questions, so you'll have to query afterwards. Is Florin? Yep. Yeah, cool. Um, Florin Patan is going to talk about um, Go with IntelliJ IDEA, and not just that, um, but it's a Go plugin for IntelliJ yep. and IntelliJ based IDEs. I might need a second or so. Actually, maybe uh, if you want to answer any questions, Joseph, yeah. if you want to answer any questions just while he sets up. Oh, yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Joseph? I have one. Do you use it for serious things? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like the, genuinely? Like, well, no, uh, it only exists for the past few weeks. So I've been working on it for the evenings after school, so nothing yet. Yeah. Cool. Right. Well, thanks again. Yes. Oh, the schedule for this. It's I tweeted it from the Golang Twitter account. It's and I have it as like a <laughs> screenshot on my phone. <laughs> but I can tell you that next up is Howard Go with uh, TyDot, which is a document database engine powered by Go. And then uh, Gover Vs Lewis is uh, writing a database driver for Khan. And then uh, Quinn Slack will present on WebLoop uh, using Seago to hook into WebKit. And finally, we'll be finishing with Remy Udafeng about why contributing to code is cool. It is cool. All right. So, yeah, I'm set up. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Florin. I'm uh, about to present you the plugin for uh, IntelliJ IDEA and other uh, IDEA based uh, IDEs from JetBrains. Um, about me, I'm a developer for about 10 years now. Uh, I've discovered Go eight months ago, and since then I've written more Java than Go due to this plugin. <laughs> 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 um, I work at Protein, where we do a football app. In case you are into football or soccer, as Americans call it, check it out. It's pretty cool. But enough about that. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know about uh, JetBrains and IntelliJ IDEA, uh, they are spe uh, specialized into creating IDEs. Uh, IDEA is uh, specialized for uh, Java and a bunch of other languages. Um, from their website, you can see that uh, they have a smart code completion, which is really smart. Uh, they can do on the flight code analysis for uh, various problems in your code. Uh, they can do refactoring of your code, moving classes, and so on. So if you are into Java, give it a try, and not only. Uh, like I said, they support uh, Scala, Groovy, uh, Clojure, yeah, plugins. Uh, they have a database uh, client integrated for uh, Postgres, uh, MySQL, Oracle, yeah, just about anything. They have uh, specialized IDEs for PHP, Python, Ruby, and uh, they work as plugins for IntelliJ as well. Uh, and yeah, here the Go plugin comes in. Uh, about uh, one year ago, the, the, the plugin was working ish, let's say. <laughs> but uh, due to the version upgrade, it uh, broke. So that, that's when I started working on it. And since then, uh, the basic features of the, the plugin that are currently sort of working most of the time are uh, language parsing and highlighting, uh, auto completion, import uh, variable, uh, unused variable and uh, parameters and whatever detection. It has Go get integration as well as Go FMT, uh, Go build, Go run. 
Uh, it supports displaying documentation for various functions and so on. Uh, yeah, let's give it a try, actually. It's much better, and I hope it will be quick. This is idea for running. I'm launching it from my debug session, so that's why it looks a bit funny. Uh, basically, when, when you start it, you have a list of your projects that you are working on, or you can create a new one. Creating a project is fairly simple. <coughs> you just go here, selecting the, the application type, and yeah, that's about it. You just need to select your Go SDK. We support multiple uh, SDK integration. Right now I have 1.1.2 and 1.2 <coughs> on my list. And running quickly through, through the steps, you'll, you'll get into this uh, Hello World application, which runs pretty well. Okay, uh, I'm finding a bit hard to, to find the mouse. Uh, like I said, we support auto completion for yeah, standard uh, packages and as well as well, third party packages. We support uh, parameter descriptions so you can easily view what, what happens there. In when you are finished with your program, if you want to, to run it, you can run it. And yeah. Hello world. Um, quickly, what, what else do we support? We support running uh, something more complex like the app engine uh, applications directly from here. Support will, better support will be added in the upcoming release. But for now, uh, in the development release, oops, I did something bad. Yeah, basically it, it should launch uh, the uh, Go app uh, engine and you should be able to, to see the page and develop uh, normally on it. Okay, and that's the last feature that I want to show you is um, the debugger support feature. I'll be quick. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, uh, it's the feature that takes up most of my time right, right now. Uh, it's basically integrating GDB into uh, IDEA, which is hard on its own. Um, but yeah, as you can see, we already have support for, for some, some parts of it. You can step through the code and you can see changes in the, in the code in real time. It, it, you can also uh, see the output mm. here. So, yeah. Okay, and quickly back to the slide. Uh, there are some bad parts of it for the moment, but we are currently waiting for contributors to, to help, or you you will have to, to wait for us to, to get around them. Uh, Go path support is not really that nice out of the box sometimes, so it could be improved. Uh, custom installations could be a bit better, but yeah, uh, sometimes maintainers have their own views <coughs> about how to pack Go in, into various operating systems. Uh, we plan to add more code, in, uh, code inspections, so for example, detecting automatically when you pass uh, uh, int64 into uh, int32 uh, function and so on, which I think we already do. Have uh, refactoring improvements. Um, yeah, there's a Go ID which uh, will be maintained from version 1.0 of the plugin. Right now it's using an older version. I've already spoke about this. Uh, I didn't show you we support uh, Go tests running directly from IDEA, which has a, a nice interface. So yeah, if you want to develop Go and you want to give it a try, please do it. We know it has bugs sometimes but you are welcome to either report them or help us fixing them. Thank you. Okay. Now, Howard. Great, so uh, welcome, Howard. How is everyone today? Good. 
All right, so next, please allow me to introduce you to our um, document database engine implemented in pure Go. Um, all right, is, does any of you speak Finnish? No? All right, um, to be honest, till this day, I don't, uh, this is a Finnish word, but till this day, I don't know the Finnish pronunciation of it. But that doesn't matter. Let's call it tied out for now. Um, <laughs> so what is tied out? Um, it's a NoSQL database engine. Um, uh, I began working on it about half a year ago. Um, it is designed to be really, to be really, really easy to be embedded into your Go programs. And also it can run a standalone HTTP service if that's how you like it. It is cross-platform. It has been tested in win and the Windows, BSD, and Linux. It is also very small, which makes it, you know, kind of nice to, uh, to use as an embedded database. Um, please search for the name on Google or GitHub to find the project. It's hosted on GitHub at the moment. So what are some of its features? To those of you who are familiar with document database engine, it's very much like CouchDB or Mongo, where you insert schema-free documents in JSON format and execute queries in JSON as well. And uh, at the moment, it supports hash index to, to assist in lookup queries. In the future, we will support range query as well, hopefully, uh, by introducing some other, other index structures. And um, a design highlight of it is that it really focuses on the throughput, on the throughput of I/O operations. So um, collections and indexes are all partitioned to allow parallel I/O operations executing in one collection, which makes it, which makes it really different from Mongo, from this perspective. Let's get a taste of the HTTP API. Um, I was hoping to make it straightforward, so in the beginning, we create a collection called article, and we allow at most four parallel I/O operations by partitioning the collection into four parts. We insert a we insert a document into the collection with some HTML parameter right there. Name is go now, and source is go now. And we place an index on the source field in the article collection, and we can query um, for articles which has source equal to golang.org. And if we want to delete, uh, delete a document, is also straightforward. Delete in article collection the document which has ID number 531. Also, um, the design emphasis uh, also puts a lot of attention to the embedded usage. So I was hoping to make the embedded usage also simple as well. Um, create, open a database, create a database, and start, start using a collection. Insert something, and this has to be, at the moment, a map between string and interface, which is how, Go, uh, how JSON is serialized into a Golang structure. But in the future, we will support, you, you can put in virtually any struct that you define, maybe a custom struct. Construct the query just like how we do it in HTTP. Evaluate the query to get result, and then do a for loop on the result to read the documents back. I hope that's simple enough. So let's run some throughput benchmark. Um, I put a lot of attention into optimizing the storage engine to make it really, really, uh, really, really fast in terms of throughput. So most database engines have a benchmark harness, like Caltrad and Mongo, to benchmark the engine speed, just to catch any performance issues. So uh, so does TDOT, uh, TIDOT. So let's run a benchmark. A uh, simple document CRUD operation, effective on two indexes, and the document is one kilobyte in size, which is fairly common. And um, on, Intel, on an Intel laptop with uh, 2.6 gigahertz CPU, TDOT has really performs really well in terms of throughput, like many times faster than Mongo. I guess it's probably because the engine is very small, 
and it doesn't have complicated features such as replica set or um, sharding and uh, other stuff. And also, because it supports parallel I.O. operations on different partitions in a collection, also makes it reasonably fast. We perform, we <laughs> we perform similar um, tests on EC2 instance, and we get still T dot wins pretty much. And um, scalability um, is sort of, well, it's not ideal. It's, it does not scale linearly according to the number of CPUs you have in your system. But it's not that bad. Um, so what's coming up next? I'm hoping to use some of um, distributed system ideas, or maybe Irish, uh, uh, Iris distributed um, centralized messaging, so that sort of protocol. Um, to maybe make it a distributed <coughs> database so that it no longer runs on a single computer but runs in a cluster to further, um, to further improve the performance. And we all love performance. Our goal is to achieve linear scalability. And may as well introduce some high availability features. Um, so since, um, since its first release six months ago, about 600 people have started the project on GitHub. I appreciate all that <laughs> and I appreciate all the contributions. Um, however, um, I pretty much wrote 90% of the code, um, so therefore I'm looking for more collaborations. Uh, use whichever tool you like. If you like, you can, mm -hmm. if you use Bizar, we can set it up on Bizar. If you use Camly, <laughs> if you use Camly Store, we will set up this repository in Camly Store. Um, thanks for your attention, and uh, feel free to ask your questions. Go ahead. Maybe I missed it. What, the, what does tied up mean? Oh, yeah. it's um. Data. It's a finished word for data. Anyone have any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, next, we have someone with a very well-suited name to Go Development. Um, go <laughs> where, where are you from? What is this? Uh, Holland. Oh, so okay. All right. <laughs> um, and he's going to talk about writing a database driver for fun and freedom. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Originally, I intended, I sort of tuned this presentation to about 10 minutes, so I'm going to skip through parts of it, maybe, or just talk really fast. <laughs> if I talk too fast, please raise your hand so I'll slow down. Um, now I actually have to get it to recognize. That's, that's all right. I'll spare you the animal noise. It's a little long. All right. Thank you. Let's see. Taha. So um, <laughs> this is uh, a side project of mine uh, that I started working on quite soon after I s discovered Go. Um, I wrote my own database driver. So first, a little bit about me. Um, at work, I'm a technical lead developer uh, at Cone Co Solutions. It's a really small company. <coughs> um, and it's basically a Microsoft job. So that means uh, C Sharp, uh, Windows, and Microsoft SQL Server. Um, you might think, what are you doing here? <laughs> it's kind of like wearing a Britney Spears t-shirt to, to a metal festival. <laughs> but still, <laughs> figure that come by. Um, but basically, we're pampered with fancy developer tools, like really nice IDEs and stuff like that. Um, but at home, I'm a full-time Linux user. Um, I feel strongly about open source. Uh, I really enjoy studying protocols, studying how stuff works but at the low level. Um, and I have a tendency to overuse bullet lists, as you will probably all notice. Um, I've dabbled with uh, Go, Angular, and lots of other stuff, uh, but Go is my main language at the moment. So that's a bit of an odd marriage of techniques, uh, mostly Microsoft on the professional side, mostly Linux on the personal side. Um, I like writing Go. Uh, I would really like my colleagues to write Go as well. Um, so a native driver uh, for Go for, SQL, uh, for SQL Server would go a very long way. Um, so Microsoft's SQL tools are really good. My colleagues won't switch away from that. Um, Go is really, really good, and I want to work with both. 
Um, at first, I tried using uh, Alex Bregman's ODBC driver, which worked really well. Um, and the guy is really good at support. If I had any problems, I could easily reach him. Um, but it does have some dependencies, especially on Linux. You have to have Unix, ODBC, uh, free TDS. It's not a pure Go solution. Um, it would have sufficed for all my needs, but instead I decided to write my own uh, driver. Um, like I said, it, uh, the current solutions have a bit of complexity, so I would like uh, uh, a pure Go solution. Um, so I thought, how hard could it be? Uh, the real reason I really wanted to write it is not because of the complexity or anything, but because I just really wanted to see if I could do it and if I could contribute to Go. Um, and like I said, I would love working at the lower level, the packet level and stuff. Uh, so, introducing Go TDS. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Microsoft SQL Server logo, it looks like this. So that's where... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it fit really well. Um, what's done at the moment is I, I can authenticate with the server, not encrypted yet, that's coming. Um, I can do simple select statements of, on integers and, and uh, far charts, so strings. Um, I can do update, insert and delete statements, par parameterized. Um, what's not done and what's coming um, soon is what you see here, transactions, uh, support for nullable types, I haven't done that yet, um, and some more data types, so you can actually work with flows and date times and stuff like that. Um, like I said, this is really a personal project, I haven't focused on performance yet, um, so once everything is implemented, once I have a fully functional driver, I'm actually going to look at performance and refactor a lot of stuff, which is quite bad at the moment, I suppose. Um, at the moment I do a lot of copying of, of, of uh, stuff instead of working with pointers and stuff like that. Uh, I really didn't think it necessary to optimize prematurely. Um, so that. Um, that's done. Uh, I'm probably going to skip this, but what's worth thinking away is that the protocol is called TDS. Uh, that SQL Server uses it was originally started uh, or developed in 1984, which is quite a while back. Um, it's been extended and extended and extended. There are a few weird parts in it, but mostly it has retained its... Uh, it, it hasn't on the shit, basically, which is a nice thing. How did I actually manage to write this SQL driver? Um, it's quite easy, actually, since Microsoft has published a full spec. Uh, so everything is documented really nicely, actually. Um, and I could just read from that and type away. That was no problem at all. I didn't have to reverse engineer anything. Um, it really saved me a lot of research. So what I did is that I first I tried to log into the SQL server from Go. And after that, I took a look at the database uh, SQL slash SQL interfaces and see how I could implement those. It's actually not database slash SQL, it's database slash SQL slash driver. Um, there are a few uh, interfaces there that if you implement them, if you satisfy them, you have a functional uh, SQL driver. Um, so I, I'm starting implementing these one by one. Um, and sometimes I look at some other database drivers to see what I could borrow. It wasn't that much, but it was really um, useful to learn how other drivers do it, because there's a lot of solutions you probably haven't thought of, uh, which you can use. Um, so to prove I'm not full of shit, I'm going to try, if I still have internet connection, to actually run a query against uh, the SQL server. As you can see, it's just the select one, two, three, um, and try to print that out. And this is the part where it always goes wrong in live demos, I suppose. But ah, there we go. So it actually works. Um, so what I learned is, I'm going to skip through this, it basically writing a database driver means assemble a package for, for, um, for a SQL server to process and learn to process its response and wrapping that up in the existing interfaces. Um, about writing a database driver in Go, Go is actually a really nice language to do this sort of stuff in. Uh, working with slices um, uh, really, really helps, it, it saves you a lot of headaches which you normally get from working with arrays. Um, everything feels very smooth, very f thought out, except UTF-16, um, because Go naturally u uses UTF-8 mostly. Uh, there's some UTF-16 uh, support in packages and stuff, um, but I had to basically adapt that to my own package. But it wasn't much of a bother, it was really easy to do, just keep it in mind if you need to work with different encodings. Um, I didn't need to use concurrency at all, uh, since the existing database the SQL uh, package actually handles that for you, it handles connection pooling, a lot of stuff. Database slash SQL really simplifies a lot for you. You only have to do some basic stuff and the rest is handled by that package. Which is sort of a double-edged sword because if you want to implement um, more advanced features of your database server, you can't actually do that um, because the, the existing interfaces don't allow for it. For example, um, if you have Mars, which is multiple active uh, result sets, that uh, basically means you can fire off multiple requests through the same connection. You can't do that out of the box if you do it through uh, database slash SQL. 
sequel, I'm sorry. I, I'm Dutch. I, I learned to pronounce it SQL for some reason. Uh, oh yeah, the biggest reason, uh, biggest takeaway I actually learned is don't use a dash in your project name. Uh, it works fine for URLs. It doesn't work fine for the compiler. You can't name your package blah dash blah, um, which isn't really a bother for me since no one uses my package directly, but it will <coughs> really screw you up if, if you do it. Um, so don't. Um, I've heard some people say don't use go in your project name either. <laughs> um, I had less of a problem with that in this case since it's basically a bridge between Go and TDS. So if you want to write a driver for something, just go do it. Um, read a lot of stuff. I, I, did, I read an immense amount of stuff before I even started writing a little bit of Go. Um, wet your appetite and then when you're actually writing stuff, read all the stuff that make you enthusiastic <laughs> about the language again because often you forget stuff that is really awesome and you can actually use it. Um, yeah, like, like I said, Go is very thought out. I'm going to skip through that. I've kissed enough butt now. Uh, some links. I've actually put it up on uh, <laughs> different sites, as you can see, um, which wasn't really necessary, but I do it because I like to. Um, Raymond's ODBC driver I mentioned. You can download it from there. And if you want to look at any of the open specifications, there's a lot more on DNS, uh, a lot of stuff. Look through it. It's like a whole bunch of PDF files. Uh, you can find it on that short link, uh, which you have approximately 15 seconds to type, I think. So, uh, thank you very much. This is my presentation. Now, where's Quinn? Right here. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. Please welcome Quinn Slock. All right. My name is Quinn, and uh, I'm at Sourcegraph. Uh, right now. You can check it out. It might be useful for some of you. But I want to talk today about a library I made that uh, helps you script web browsers. It's called WebLoop, and it's kind of like PhantomJS. How many of you have heard of PhantomJS? Okay, so pretty much everybody. It's like PhantomJS, but for Go, so it's much better. <laughs> so why would you want something like this anyway? Well, it's good for testing. If you have some complex app you want to test, if you want to scrape the web, that's useful. And then if you have some application where the user can have like a web view, but you want to interact with it in certain ways, then you're going to need a script that web view. So that's where this comes in handy. So here's how PhantomJS describes itself, and here's the simple canonical example. You open a page, then you get a callback, and then you can run some code. And here they just exit. That seems like a boring thing to do. So I'll show you some <laughs> other things that we can do. Uh, and then, you know, PhantomJS already exists, so why rewrite this in Go? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but they mainly boil down to I just like Go a lot better. And I can come up with bullet points, but really the bottom one is just code word for I love Go. Uh, so here's WebLoop. It builds on these three other libraries. And I will do a demo of it right now. So you have a web page, you just want to run some JavaScript in the context of that web page. So um, I made a little script. Oh. Let me hook that up. Okay, so I made that little one line script, and then you can run it with this little command. You say the URL is the first argument. That's the context it runs in. <coughs> and then the script file. So you run it. And it's a little bit slow because it has to like, load up GTK and load up uh, WebKit and all of that. But behind the scenes, it does all that. And it loads it up in some WebKit view, executes that script, and then gives you the response just as a JSON encoded value. So there's a lot of stuff going on right there. But that's the simple output. And you can make that a lot more complex and get a lot more other information out of the page. So the next demo I'll do is this is a little bit more complex. So if you have like an Angular app or some other single page app that is a total you know, rich JavaScript app, the problem is if your users don't have JavaScript enabled or if there is a search crawler, they're not going to see anything. They're not going to see any of your content. And that sucks. So how can you show them a pre-generated static HTML page with the content uh, so that even if they can't use the app, they can get some of the data? So I'll show you how this is done. Um, so let me resize this. 
So here is a simple app. It's like a list of cities. And this is Chrome, which has JavaScript enabled right now. It's running Angular. And I can click around and shows you, you know, the information. So that's great. That's an Angular app. But now I'm in a browser where we don't have JavaScript enabled. Or I could be like the Googlebot. So all I see is this. There's nothing there. So that sucks. So I have on another port, uh, basically it's WebLoop provides an HTTP handler that says go and hit this other server and emulate being a browser. Look at what the HTML is after the Angular app is run and then take that statically generated HTML and present it back to the original request as the response. So it's just an HTTP handler that you can stick into your own web applications and it'll go and do all that work behind the scenes for you and present your users who don't have JavaScript or a Googlebot with this nice statically rendered page. And this is statically rendered. You can see if I click on a different page, the whole page changes. It's not where you know only part of the page changes in Angular. And you could throw this up in front of your web page and then uh, Googlebot and your non-JS users would be happy. All right. Um, so I want to integrate this with some other Go web frameworks. Uh, like Martini and some of the other ones that people use. And if you're interested in contributing an implementation of a handler or middleware, then I would love to get that. And then also do asynchronous messaging so that you can uh, wait for a page to have a certain condition and then run some JavaScript in there. Right now you have to poll. And that's actually possible with WebKit too. Um, so Seago Experiences is a library author. It's been really good overall. There's nothing that I would change, but some things to be aware of. People are not expecting like package config to run when they run go get. And probably half the issues that I've gotten on this repository has been like, I don't have this dependency. And the other thing is builds are slower. So maybe if you could use a shared C library, that would speed things up during compilation. It's not a big deal, but GTK and uh, WebKit are pretty big. So it takes like five seconds on a nice machine. Um, I'll, is that the end? Okay, that's it. So I'll take any questions. You can go and look at the code. I was going to show what it looked like, but you all have computers. Which JavaScript engine did it use? Other uh, child processes? It uses whatever WebKit 2 has. Do you know what that is? Um, I assume it's V8. What's that? Yeah. Mm hmm. Can you use it to display a, dyna a dynamic website in links, for example? Yeah, you could. Yeah, I mean, if you open up this thing that I had in Firefox in links, it would show you the HTML. <laughs> yeah, you could use it as like an end user, just to proxy the entire web. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, our final lightning talk, unless somebody spontaneously decides to do one. So we do have space for one more, if there is one more person. Um, but if not, I welcome uh, Remy Udumfeng, who is, uh, you, do you have any slides? Or you just no, no, no. Um, who's actually uh, one of the uh, committers on the Go project, and has done a great, whole lot of amazing compiler work. And so <coughs> he's going to tell us, why contributing to Go is called. Cool. Okay, so I am uh, Rémy uh, Oudemfeng. I work in Paris for a large uh, French bank. And uh, we are using Go professionally, essentially, since uh, 2011. And, uh, well, for the moment, I use it essentially professionally and not really for personal projects because I do some other things uh, at home. And, um, at first, we wanted to use essentially for systems programming, and progressively, we, we explored usage as, as a general programming language. And uh, uh, we didn't initially expect to contribute significantly to, to Go. So actually, the, the Go rep repository is a lot of fun things. It's uh, a lot of interesting code. For example, the standard library is of uh, exceptional quality. Uh, varying depending of, uh, on the libraries, but for example, it is uh, somewhere where you can find uh, a readable HTTP implementation 
you can find readable cryptographic code or you can find readable well uh, a lot of things and uh, it is also fun to have a compiler which is only a few thousand lines of code because uh, uh, I absolutely never uh, saw a GCC or LLVM code so it was the first time I could read and even write uh, a bit of compiler code so what did we do? Uh, the first thing we, uh, the first significant contribution we uh, we had to do was uh, an improvement to the strconv library uh, because we wanted to be able to parse numbers efficiently because we had a lot of numbers to read and of course uh, since people don't do things very efficiently we had we had a lot of numbers to read in plain text. So this is extremely slow, and the initial uh, implementation uh, available in the Go standard library was not very, not very fast at all. So uh, we wanted to port in, the in plain Go the algorithm which is used in the double conversion library, which is, for example, used in V8 or, or something. And uh, it took, I think it took me a few weeks and months to uh, totally implement the algorithms found uh, in that library and I, m I think the result written in Go is more readable than the, the initial one which used templates and uh, every, every possible C++ feature just to parse a string into a number. And uh, well after that we, I, I had a lot of random, uh, random things, something like, uh, like bug fixes essentially in the compiler in uh, mm, some at some point in GCC Go also, or in the race detector, and uh, usually these were uh, almost always motivated by real needs. Not always because sometimes uh, there are some fun things to do or some fun bugs to fix. And um, for example, the STR, STR conf case were uh, was motivated by uh, performance. But we also had to um, implement freeing of uh, memory uh, to return to the operating system because initially uh, you could have a Go program, uh, let it run for a while, it would allocate some memory and then never return it uh, although the garbage collector has, uh, has worked. So uh, for some a bit of haddock, a scavenger uh, thing was implemented in the runtime and it was contributed upstream uh, two years ago. Also, uh, the work on uh, the race detector was to uh, have it working uh, a bit uh, a bit uh, earlier because uh, it was uh, an amazing piece of uh, software and I couldn't run it on my code because of some compiler issue. So it was um, uh, very interesting trying to dig into the compiler sometimes uh, a bit annoying uh, to have it work properly on uh, on all of our code and also contributing to go has many advantages uh, like uh, having your code reviewed by amazing people uh, because uh, I think it's uh, it's not very often that you can have code reviewed by Russ Cox or by Rob Pike uh, it gives you free uh, distributed testings on the user because uh, sometimes you can have some improvement to a standard library on your local repository but well it might be useful but <coughs> you don't have really time to test it completely so if it's good enough to be uh, accepted in the uh, in the main repository you have it tested by thousands of people and that's uh, pretty cool and also uh, I think uh, an interesting thing is uh, uh, trying to indirectly improve uh, projects we like. For example, uh, I think uh, Brad makes me want to try Camly Store and uh, if my contributions can help Camly Store work better, I'm uh, pretty happy to, to see that happen. Uh, and finally, I think there is a, a lot of work to do. Uh, uh, the compiler is still easy to crash. For example, there are uh, a few annoying bugs that are, that are still open and I think some of them are really, really hard to fix. Also, uh, there are some bugs I, I encounter and I would like somebody to fix them. For example, um, in uh, it's been six months since we are annoyed by a bug in the GNU uh, C library, which makes uh, DNS requests go on random file descriptors. <laughs> we we were hit by that in in June and actually the well 
uh, it happened by somebo that uh, somebody else uh, also encountered the bugs. And well, it's just a race condition. If you if you use the the default Go standard library, it will use C Go to resolve host names, so all requests will go to the C library. And if you, in parallel, have open circuits, and if you do also name resolutions, the you will see random packets <coughs> happen uh, on your yeah. file descriptors, which is quite annoying. And uh, I think nobody, nobody tried to fix it uh, in the C library, or maybe many people tried, but nobody succeeded. So I, I hope that some someday <laughs> someone will fix it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I tried reading the C library code, and it's really horrible. <laughs> and uh, well, there are so very large transformations will will come in the in the next weeks. And uh, Andrew has already said something, so I hope uh, there are, there will be still a lot of ex exciting things to do. How many hundred changes do you have in the standard library at this point? I didn't count, but uh, that's not so many. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, there there may not be that many, but they're pretty good changes. <laughs> that's cool. All right. Well, that's it. Thank you to everybody who's been hanging out in here all day, or if you've just been here for the last little while. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, send mail to the Boston organizers and tell them that we need a bigger room next year. Because <laughs> um, I think yeah. we probably do. I think we could go for a bigger room. Um, and yeah, of course, uh, if any of you have things you want to talk about next year, please uh, follow the Golang Twitter account and I'll let you know when we're taking uh, proposals or whatever. Um, I should mention Francesca speaking in Brussels tomorrow. He's also a member of the Go team. Yeah, it's um, going to be at 6 p.m. at the Google office in Brussels. So if you're in Brussels tomorrow, it's yeah, going to be here. Probably. There'll be beer there. So in case you haven't had enough beer this weekend. Um, and uh, uh, if you're from Berlin or going back there, uh, I will be speaking in Berlin on Tuesday night. I don't know if there are any spaces left at the event, but there may be. And also, uh, Francesca speaking in Paris on Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday at Google Office, but in Paris. So, that was it. So if you haven't had enough go, there's more. Will there be wine there? I <laughs> actually have a very cool room with champagne and everything. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I wish I was going there. Um, also, uh, there is a Go conference, the first kind of large scale dedicated Go conference in Denver, Colorado, in the United States in April called GoForCon. And the lineup looks pretty awesome. Um, everyone except for me looks great. Um, the, uh, yeah, it should, it should be really. Fantastic. Also, uh, recently quietly announced is uh, the Dot .go conference, which will be a one-day uh, Go event organized by the Dot .cloud people uh, in Paris in October. And um, I think at least a few of us here will be there. Um, so keep an eye on that, too. Uh, let's go and drink. <laughs> <laughs>